morning, everybody. Thank you uh, for being here. And again, I apologize. In addition to that, uh, there is a classified briefing at 11 o'clock. So uh, we will do our best. Uh, certainly everyone here will get a chance to, to uh, speak on this important issue. Uh, and I have read all your testimony. I am prepared, but I will uh, kind of work this through a little bit. So I appreciate your indulgence. According to economists, the Great Recession ended in 2009. Yet five years later, we're still, still struggling to see any signs of a robust, lasting economic econ growth in our economy. The nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office estimates a, a long-term average annual growth rate of 2.2 uh, percent, a substantial decrease from the pace that existed between two, 1948 and 2007, uh, which averaged about 3.4 percent. We all heard various reasons for the causes of uh, uh, the United States' a lackluster rebound, excessive regulation, complex tax code, and a workforce shortage, uh, to name a few. We've also heard several solutions and frequently have looked for uh, small businesses to lead the way to greater prosperity. Small firms are the catalyst for growth for creation, creating more than half of the net new jobs between 1993 and 2013. Even more no noteworthy are the contributions of new firms, which offer the best opportunity for growth. However, as economists have, have examined American stagnant economy, a disturbing new trend has emerged. Fewer new b businesses are being created each year than the year before. According to a recent report from the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland uh, in 1978, Americans created 12 new firms, uh, for every existing firm. But in 2011, this dropped uh, to almost half, to 6.2. New firm cr um, per existing businesses. Even more startling, economic research suggests that while the Great recess uh, uh, Recession exacerbated this drop, the decline has actually been occurring for over 30 years. Uh, this downturn not only has a dramatic negative impact on our economy, but also signals that entrepreneurship may not be as strong and vibrant in America as it has historically been, or certainly that we'd like it to be. Today we are here to learn more about what this decline in new business creation means for the American economy and what we might do to preserve, reverse this trend. I'd like to thank all of our witnesses uh, for being here today. And uh, I yield to uh, Ranking Member Meng for her opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you to our witnesses for uh, all being here today. Uh, in this committee, we frequently talk about how small businesses are central to job creation. A more accurate assessment might be that new small businesses are vital to job growth. It is indisputable that small businesses are a big employer in the U.S. However, it is a subset of these companies that create the bulk of new jobs. Several analyses have found that 90, while 90% 90 of companies employ less than 19 workers, the strongest correlation to job creation isn't size so much as age. 40% of small business job creation stems from new businesses, even though new firms represent only 10% of small firm employment. Likewise, older, more established firms account for two-thirds of small business employment but they create less than one-third of new jobs. In short, as this committee looks to accelerate economic growth and job creation, we would be wise to focus on newer firms that are seeking to grow quickly. Not only do these firms create employment opportunities, but they often innovate the new products and services that keep our economy competitive internationally. Given the outsized importance new in enterprises play in job growth and competitiveness, it is disturbing to see long-term reductions in the rate of new business creation. Last year, we saw 38,000 fewer business owners per month than in 2012. This reduction remained constant throughout all demographic groups, from women to minorities, veterans, and immigrants. There was a decided drop in new business formation. Certainly, some of this recent reduction can be attributed to job market improvements. When Americans are able to secure well-paying jobs elsewhere, there is less incentive to pursue the relatively risky path of entrepreneurship. Nonetheless, we would be short-sighted to ignore long, longer-term trends that suggest a reduction in bu new business formation. 
In the three decades between 1978 and 2011, the percentage of firms less than one year old fell by more than half, suggesting that reductions in business creation are not a short-term anomaly. If our nation is to remain an economic leader, we must maintain the entrepreneurial spirit that has long defined us. From a public policy pers perspective, this means pursuing a number of strategies that can help more Americans launch new enterprises. Access to capital is a perennial challenge for most startups. Traditional debt financing remains difficult for small firms to secure. I hope this committee can work together to ensure government guaranteed loans backed by the SBA, including microfinancing, are widely available. Likewise, equity financing must remain an option whether it is through crowdfunding, private venture capital, or the Small Business Investment Company program. Just as capital is critical for a new enterprise, so too is knowledge and know-how. In that regard, technical assistance and entrepreneurial development programs can provide valuable help to fledgling businesses. It is incumbent on this committee and all of Congress to provide adequate resources for SBA initiatives that provide this type of counseling. Mr. Chairman, one of the pillars of the American economy has always been a robust, thriving sense of entrepreneurship. As long as our nation continues creating new businesses, we can expect future job growth and greater economic opportunity for all Americans. In that regard, I look forward to hearing from our witnesses about the state of new business creation and what can be done to help more Americans launch their own enterprises. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank you. Uh, if committee members have an opening statement prepared, I ask that they submit it for the record. You all have uh, five minutes. Relax. We'll be flexible about that. The yellow light means what every other yellow light in the world means. Um, uh, our first witness today is uh, Jonathan uh, Ortmund, who served as a senior fellow at the Kauffman Foundation. S serves as. Uh, in his capacity, he, he advises the Foundation on Global Entrepreneurship and brings important research findings to the attention of policymakers. Uh, Mr. Ortmund, you may begin. And thank you. Uh, Chairman Hanner and uh, Ranking Member Meng, thank you so much. And uh, members of the committee, uh, thank you for this opportunity uh, to testify about a troublesome trend in entrepreneurship, indeed the declining rate of new business creation. Uh, as the world's largest private foundation focused on the study and promotion of entrepreneurship, the Ewing Marion Coffin Foundation has been at the center of this issue for some time. Our financial commitments to data collection helped uncover this trend. And our research has illuminated not only some possible explanations for the decline, but also ways in which public policy can create an environment more conducive to business formation and growth. New business creation is crucial, crucial to a healthy, vibrant economy for two primary reasons. Obviously, job creation, but also innovation. And contrary to popular rhetoric, uh, it is not small businesses, but rather new and young businesses that drive uh, new job creation. Nearly all net new jobs are created by new and young companies. Similarly, startups are responsible for a disproportionate share of innovative activity, which creates not just wealth for the entrepreneur, but I think more importantly, rising standards of living for all. These twin functions of entrepreneurship comprise the core of the United States' economic preeminence. It is therefore why we should be concerned that we are witnessing this declining business creation rate, which threatens that position. In the late 1970s, about 15% of businesses were new. In 2011, that number hovered around 8%. And since 2000, even high growth entrepreneurship has been in decline, surprising us all, as epitomized by a slowdown in the technology industry. Although some of the uh, declining share is natural as the economy ages, the trend has been accelerated by lower entry rates of new firms coupled with higher exit rates of young firms. This declining business dynamism has been taking place for decades across all sectors, raising serious concerns with regards to unemployment and lackluster wage growth. Despite this discouraging picture, there are reasons that we can be more, more optimistic. Although the best data on entrepreneurship is presently only available through 2011. Early indicators point toward a full recovery of the business startup rate.
from the effects of the Great Recession. I should also note that it is only recent that uh, in Washington, D.C., we have been uh, articulating uh, that it's going to require a different policy toolbox to deal with accelerating rates of new firm formation as opposed to the more generic, uh, uh, broader question we faced in, in years past as to how do we encourage small, uh, support small businesses more broadly. And looking more long term, there's some other reasons for us to be optimistic. The demographic winds are changing. Over the next 20 years, we will have more people than ever in their 30s and 40s. This is really important. The average age of a US-born tech entrepreneur is 39 years old, the peak age for entrepreneurship. And this new generation of entrepreneurs will also have unprecedented numbers and types of education and training resources available to them, which should make for a stronger entrepreneurial ecosystem. We're also seeing an explosion of other kinds of programs and efforts, especially at the state and local level. There is an enormous amount of going on, work going on to create more healthy entrepreneurial ecosystems that's relatively new and something that we can't yet measure the effect and impact that they're having on the ability uh, and the willingness of individual Americans to take a risk and form new firms. Finally, entrepreneurs of every stripe will have access to new forms of finance. As was mentioned in the opening statements, crowdfunding remains in its infancy but several platforms have shown both strong growth and potential for the future. These developments held promise in reversing the long-term decline of new business creation, but the extent of their impact will depend upon good public policy. While more Americans will be entering the peak age for entrepreneurship, this same age group is increasingly burdened by student loan debt, which may discourage potential entrepreneurs from starting a business. Debt and delayed work opportunities must be addressed so that younger Americans are financially able to engage in entrepreneurship. Other policy tools also exist, first among them the creation of visa for immigrant entrepreneurs that allows foreign job creators to start and operate businesses in America. As we know, immigrants are more likely to found businesses than natives, and these businesses generally more in, have generally more innovations than the average native founded business. The creation of a startup visa would have an immediate impact on business creation and growth. Congress should also examine the role of regulatory accumulation and the role it may play in depressing entrepreneurial activity. We should be looking at uh, new ways of uh, avoiding the, uh, for example, superfluous licensing regulations that can unnecessarily reduce competition. The declining business creation rate is deserving of policymakers' attention because of new and firm, young firms' disproportionate role in job creation and innovation. We at the Coffin Foundation will continue to do our part in terms of exploring the reasons for this decline and ways in which we might be the, the, uh, the, the, it might be mitigated and reversed. And in fact, I'm pleased to tell you that in early 2016, we plan to unveil a new entrepreneurial growth agenda, which will identify ways the United States can attain a new, faster growing, and more broad-based entrepreneurial economy. While there are reasons to be optimistic about the future, business creation rates are unlikely to rebound without support of good public policy. And therefore, I greatly appreciate the opportunity today to testify before you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ortman. Our second witness today is John Deary, who serves as the Executive Vice President for Policy at the Financial Services Forum. Prior to joining the forum in 2001, he spent nine years at the Federal Reserve Bank in New York. Recently, he co-authored a book, Where the Jobs Are, a book that examines the very issues we're talking about today. Uh, thank you for being here, Mr. Deere. You may begin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Me Member Mang. In the, in the interest of our limited time and, and because your opening statements uh, and Mr. Ortman's statement uh, I think makes clear that we all understand the nature of the problem, I'm going to dispense with my written script and just tell you a bit um, in just a couple of uh, uh, minutes about the, uh, the project that, that was the basis uh, of the book and that I think will be very helpful to you as you consider policy solutions to, to this very, very important problem. Um, I should say that my background, as you just indicated, is in financial and economic policy. The importance of new businesses, uh, both to job creation and, as Mr. Ortman's uh, uh, made clear, very importantly, to innovation. And the reason why that is important is, of course, innovation uh, drives productivity growth, which drives economic growth. So from the standpoint of, of both job creation and economic growth, uh, uh, new businesses are really where the action is and is why this hearing and your work is so important. Uh, a colleague of mine and I at the Financial Services Forum 
uh, uh, learned about the importance of new businesses and the decline, the secular decline uh, in new businesses and entrepreneurship in the, in the spring of 2011. Uh, we were terribly concerned about this in the context of job creation and the, and the weak recovery uh, and wanted to figure out why is this happening. The obvious question is why is this happening? Um, after uh, 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 considering a number of investigative alternatives, we decided in the end that probably the best way to figure out what was going on uh, with the nation's entrepreneurs was to get out of Washington, D.C. and go talk to them. Uh, so with, with that in mind, we organized roundtables uh, with entrepreneurs in 12 cities across the United States. We picked those cities very carefully, not only to cover the geographic expanse of the country, obviously you don't want to do all the roundtables east of the Mississippi, um, and also to cover the industrial diversity of the economy. As you are as you're aware, certain cities and regions tend to be associated with um, uh, certain industry sectors. And so we picked our cities very carefully to get a really uh, a good cross-section of both the uh, geogra uh, geographic expanse of the country as well as the industrial diversity of the economy. Um, as you can imagine, those roundtables were absolutely fascinating. Um, I, and I would say that the, uh, perhaps the most re a remarkable takeaway for us, uh, and certainly from the standpoint of, of potential policy solutions for you all to consider, um, uh, uh, and we were quite surprised by this because it was our expectation that we would hear different things at the different roundtables. It is a very big country, after all, a very industrially diverse economy. The startup scene in, say, Cambridge, Massachusetts is really different than the startup scene in Columbus, Ohio, or Orlando, Florida, or Seattle, or all these other places we went. And yet, um, we realized that we were hearing, uh, you know, with some differences in regional emphasis, you might say, but we were hearing the same half dozen or so major themes everywhere we went in terms of what is in their way. Um, and in their own words, I will just run through these very quickly. Uh, we have the jobs and we need to fill them in order to grow. We can't find enough people that have the skills that we need. Uh, our immigration policies are blocking our ability to attract and retain the world's best talent and we need them. Uh, access to capital for startups is even more difficult in the wake of the financial crisis. Overregulation is killing us. Tax complexity and uncertainty is diverting far too much attention away from our new businesses. Uh, and finally, and with apologies, uh, there is far too much economic uncertainty, and it is Washington's fault. Um, we recorded all of our conversations, which gave us the opportunity to transcribe those uh, uh, discussions so we could go back and read them over and over again and really get to understand what the entrepreneurs were telling us and to pull out consistent themes. Um, we um, uh, subsequently, as I mentioned, uh, uh, wrote uh, where the jobs are. Uh, and in that book, we propose 30 specific policy proposals based on what the entrepreneurs told us they need. Um, and and they are all in my written testimony. Um, uh, I think that what is uh, of, of, of unique value in, to those proposals is because they come, as I say, they are all based on what the entrepreneurs told us they need. In fact, many of them came right from the entrepreneurs themselves who, in the course of our roundtable, said, you know, it would be really great if the government would do X. And, and Courtney and I would look across the table at each other and nod and write it down. So I commend those proposals to you. I am happy to answer any questions about them or anything else that we did on our, our, our summer road trip. Thank you. Thank you. So there is nothing new under the sun. Thank you. Uh, our third witness today is Mr. Chad Moutre. Mr. Moutre is the Chief Economist for the National Association of Manufacturers. Previously, Mr. Moutre was the Chief Economist and Director of Economic Research for the Office of Advocacy for, a small business, for the Small Business Administration from 2002 to 2010. Thank you very much for being here. You may begin. Uh, thank you, Chairman Hanna, Ranking Member Ming, and thank you for the opportunity to testify uh, on the issue of, of business formation and policies that can help increase the overall uh, economic activity. Uh, I will be tackling these issues, as you might imagine, from a, from a manufacturing perspective. The National Association of Manufacturers is the largest industrial trade association and voice for more than 12 million men and women who make things in America. The NAM is committed to achieving a policy agenda that helps manufacturers grow and create jobs. Manufacturers very much appreciate your interest in and in supporting the manufacturing economy. Manufacturing activity has seen a resurgence since the end of the recession, and manufacturers mostly are upbeat about the coming months and the next few years. Yet they are also frustrated with the overall slowness of the recent recovery, making, making business leaders more cautious in their assessments than they might otherwise be. 
A number of downsize risks, of course, exist in the coming months, including geopolitical events, as you well know, uh, uh, the prospect of rising interest rates, and softness in several key export markets. At the same time, manufacturers of all sizes and in a wide swath of industries have expressed concern about skills gap shortages. The mostly positive outlook stands in contrast to the decline in business formation rates, which is the, which is the basis of this hearing. The number of manufacturers have also fallen dramatically over the past decade, from 354,498 establishments in 2000 to 295,643 establishments in 2011, the most recent year that there was data. The rate of manufacturing establishment startups have also declined, according to the business employment dynamics data from the BLS, off from 2.25 percent of all establishments in 1995 to 1.45 percent in 2013. In terms of raw numbers, there were roughly 8,000 manufacturing startups per quarter in 1995, with around 5,000 per quarter in the, in the 2011 to 2013 timeframe. It is also clear that closures have exceeded startups in the sector since at least 1999. At least part of this trend could be explained by the tremendous consolidation that has taken place in the manufacturing sector, yet the churn rate for manufacturers is significant, mostly because it mirrors other data, as much as you have heard already. In addition, a number of factors might help explain the reduced business formation rates. First and foremost, economic growth has been much slower more recently. Real GDP growth averaged 3.8 percent in the 1990s. Uh, while the sector experienced modest growth after the 2001 recession, the economy grew by an average of 2.7 percent between 2002 and 2007. Since the Great Recession of 2007 and 2009, real GDP growth has averaged just 2.2 percent, as you just mentioned. Uh, indeed, the consensus forecast for 2015 uh, is for roughly 3 percent growth, but if that is true, it would be the first year since 2005 that we would have had a 3 in front of our GDP growth figures. Uh, this more sluggish economic activity likely serves as a disincentive for new business creation or for, new ex or for existing firms potentially dissuading investments in new capital spending or in hiring. Along those lines, non-residential fixed investment also has increased at a much slower pace, down from an average of 8.6 percent in the 1990s to 5.4 percent and 5.1 percent, respectively, in the 2003 to 2007 and 2010 and to 2013 timeframes. Employment growth has also decelerated. One must look at a number of business environment conditions really as a possible source for, that also might discourage business formation. Indeed, economic and political uncertainty, the need for comprehensive tax reform, rising health insurance costs and rising regulatory burdens have often been cited as possible factors for explaining reduced business activity, and we could spend a lot of time talking about each one of those elements. Uh, but I am going to talk about regulations. Uh, yesterday, the NAM released a study on total fe Federal regulatory compliance costs by Mark Crane and Nicole Crane. This analysis updated the author's prior work for the Office of Advocacy at the SBA, where I used to be the chief economist, as you mentioned. Uh, this report found that businesses spent $2.028 trillion to comply with Federal regulations in 2012. More recently, compliance costs for businesses in the United States averaged uh, $9,991 per employee uh, in 2012, with manufacturers incurring a per employee cost of nearly double that amount, $19,564 per employee. Small manufacturers with less than 50 employees spent a whopping $34,671 per employee, illustrating the massive burden that we are placing on many of these small businesses and manufacturers. Manufacturers believe that regulation is critical to the protection of work worker safety, public health, and our environment. At the same time, our regulatory system is in need of improvement. We need smarter regulations that minimize unnecessary burdens and better balance benefits and costs, eliminating redundancies wherever possible. Regulations are allowed to accumulate with no real effort to evaluate or clean up the outdated or obsolete rules already on the books. It is imperative that policymakers and regulators understand the cumulative burdens that these rules are placing on businesses and enact policies that minimize those costs that do not contribute to the realization of regulatory objectives. The Crane and Crane Report also illustrates how regulatory relief can be an economic development issue. In a survey conducted by, by these authors, 85 percent of manufacturers responded that they would invest more in their business, both in their workers and in capital equipment, if their compliance costs could be lessened even a little. These, manu these business leaders hope that policymakers look at the larger regulatory landscape before imposing new burdens that will stifle growth and dissuade investments. 
In conclusion, Chairman Hanna, Ranking Member Ming, and other members of the subcommittee, thank you for your leadership on this issue and for holding this hearing. Falling business rate formation rates are a challenge and one that is worthy of your attention. Thank you. I will yield to uh, Ranking Member Meng to uh, introduce our next witness. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dr. John Deskins is the Director of the Bureau of Business and Economic Research and Associate Professor of Economics at West Virginia University. His recent research has focused on small business growth, U.S. state economic development efforts, and government tax and expenditure policy. His work has appeared in journals including Small Business Economics, Public Finance Review, and Economic Development Quarterly, amongst others. He holds a Ph.D. in economics from the University of Tennessee. Thanks for being here. Chairman Hanna, Ranking Member Ming, and members of the committee, thank you so much for inviting me today to discuss the very important role that small businesses play in our economy. Numerous statistics from the Small Business Administration and other sources suggest that small businesses do indeed play a vital role in our economy. For instance, as we know already, statistics based on standard SBA definitions indicate that small firms represent the large majority of firms in the nation, small firms employ around half of the total U.S. private sector workforce, and small firms have historically accounted for uh, more than half of the net job creation in the U.S. And furthermore, Academic research has demonstrated the importance of small business to economic growth using advanced statistical methods. Recent research has rigorously demonstrated that new business formation is not simply correlated with a good economy, but is indeed a key driver of economic growth. My own co-authored research has found that small business establishment births are the single largest determinant of output and employment growth at the U.S. state level. This suggests that fostering an environment that is fertile for small business formation and growth is likely to be more fruitful than many of the simpler policy levers that officials often look toward. Research has found that new firms are more likely to promote economic growth as a result of innovation compared to existing firms, and research has also shown that new firms often increase competitive pressure on existing firms, forcing those existing firms to be more competitive, thereby creating a broader economic benefit for society. Now, as the terms small business and entrepreneurship are somewhat vague notions, research has also refined our understanding of the specific types of small businesses that are most effective in promoting economic growth. Here, as has been mentioned before, the key finding is that new firms are most important to economic prosperity, not necessarily small firms. However, new business formation rates in the U.S. have suffered during recent years, and it stands to reason that this decline is a significant concern as it relates to innovation and long-run economic growth. It is imperative that public policy is structured to be conducive to small business formation to help ensure that our economy remains healthy and innovative in the long run. Now, fortunately, a large literature has developed that examines the ways in which public policy affects small business activity. This research has investigated the question using a variety of data, survey data, tax return data, aggregated data, and at multiple levels, national, state, and local. The literature has investigated a variety of tax and expenditure policies, such as various income tax rate measures and tax credits, as well as non-rate policies, such as depreciation policy and the deductibility of health insurance premiums. Some important findings from this literature are as follows. Federal income tax rates and credits do matter. Research has convincingly shown that a relatively more favorable tax policy toward the self-employed compared to wage and salary workers does increase self-employment. A sample of findings in this area is as follows. A lower average tax rate for self-employment income relative to that of wage and salary income has been shown to encourage the transition to self-employment. Higher expected marginal income tax rates faced by the self-employed have been shown to shorten spells of self-employment and correspondingly increases in the expected marginal income tax rate for wage and salary income, relatively speaking, increases length of uh, self-employment. Further spending on research and development is positively influenced by tax credits towards small business. Other tax policies, aside from rates, are also found to matter in recent research. For instance, research has shown that greater deductibility of health insurance premiums for federal income tax purposes does reduce exit from self-employment. However, it's important to remember that tax avoidance and tax evasion are often more pronounced for the self-employed. Research has shown that evasion and avoidance are likely to be uh, one of the drivers 
behind the transition into self-employment. Indeed, entry into self-employment may actually be high when marginal rates in general are high, driven by the potential to evade or avoid taxes. And altogether, this implies that policymakers should be mindful of the potential for inno inefficient tax avoidance or illegal tax evasion when crafting policy towards small business. Policymakers must also be mindful, however, that some of the identified behavioral effects that I mentioned before, while they are readily apparent, they are oftentimes small in magnitude. In contrast to these findings, some research has failed to identify any relationship between other elements of public policy and small business activity. For example, recent research has failed to identify that more favorable depreciation rules towards small business um, has been effective in promoting small business activity. Thank you again for the invitation. I look forward to your comments. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Deary, uh, I want to ask anybody here, actually, um, one of the things we talk about a lot is a skills gap, which for me directly relates to our immigration policy and our, in a, our lack of dealing with it directly, uh, particularly with um, highly skilled individuals who uh, have other options now. At one time, their options were much more limited. They can go back to a number of places that welcome them uh, more clearly and more easily than we do. Uh, and I want to talk about risk, but um, visas for the highly skilled, anybody here uh, can confirm or deny or push back in any way you like, but I would like to hear your opinion. Uh, a, a couple of quick comments. Um, uh, first of all, um, very quickly on your comment about um, uh, there is nothing new under the sun yet. I, I, I take your point well that you know none of the things that we heard from entrepreneurs around the country are terribly shocking in terms of the problems. Uh, uh, but the fact that we heard it everywhere we, we went at individual unrelated roundtables, I think, underscores that these really are the problems. And one of them is the one that you speak to in terms of the skills gap and, and its relationship to our uh, our policies uh, uh, with regard to immigration. Um, uh, I, I know that there is a lot of debate about the skills gap there. I have talked with folks here in Washington uh, who absolutely deny it because they say that if there were a skills gap, you would see it showing up in wage data, and it is not showing up in wage data. I think there are reasons, uh, or at least some uh, reasons, why, why it is not showing up. P one is, and we heard this at roundtables all across the country, so many of the skills the, uh, these days uh, that uh, the small businesses and entrepreneurs need are highly commoditized or, or they are commoditizable. It is very easy to outsource, for example, coding assignments. Uh, and when entrepreneurs can't find local talent, it's very easy to outsource that work somewhere else. And so, therefore, there's not upward pressure on wages. Um, uh, uh, with regard to um, uh, uh, the importance of, of, of more foreign-born talent, uh, our recommendation in the book is to eliminate uh, the cap on H-1B visas. Keep the criteria. The criteria are very, very important. But as you know, Mr. Chairman, uh, uh, we have about 85,000 H-1Bs this year. Um, all, of the, all of the openings for H-1B visas were taken up within five days of them becoming available this year. It is clear that we need many, many more. Uh, and the problem is, is that when you limit something, you make the price higher. And too often, startups with, uh, 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 that have the least amount of cash and resources to uh, uh, get foreign-born talent by way of H-1B visas are shut out of the process. Well, thank you. Uh, we have, um Go ahead, Mr. Ortman. Well, I'll just add a couple of very quick comments. I think the most important thing we've got to remember is that um, new firms are not necessarily founded by individuals; they're founded by teams. So we're not, you know, this isn't an idea that you let all these foreigners into the country who, you know, it's all <coughs> people from outside the United States. So they, they bring talent to a founding team, which I think is really important for us to remember. And we obviously did a we did a study at the Coffin Foundation that showed that actually that. <clears throat> this is such a small number of people we're talking about giving some kind of startup visa to uh, that, but the, the they're obviously net job creators, and this is really hard for I think the average citizen to understand. Uh, I mean, our study showed that uh, uh, after ten years, uh, certainly one of the proposals for a startup visa would create 1.6 million jobs. Thank you. So I don't think there's any evidence to show there's any kind of crowding out uh, hypothesis as far as the declining rates. I, in the interest of time, I'm going to turn to uh, Ranking Member Mangan. Uh. Thank you. Um, I'm curious that 
it's often talked about that students graduating with relevant majors are not graduating with the skills that uh, employers are seeking. Are there efforts that entrepreneurs or associations representing these small businesses are making to communicate with colleges and universities on what the industry needs are and how academic institutions can change their curriculums to address the skills gap? So yes, so certainly from the manufacturing perspective, this is something we hear almost universally across all, all sectors. Uh, we actually have a workforce task force that is meeting right now, led by many of our CEOs from our member companies. Uh, it is something that our manufacturing institute is very uh, uh, devoted to. Uh, and I think that one of the things that we are trying to do is to get our manufacturers to meet with educational institutions and their state and local uh, economic development entities to try to proactively come up with curricula that will meet the needs of, of manufacturers. Uh, I was just at a manufacturer down in, in Virginia Beach about a month ago, and because of the lack of workers in their area, they actually have a high school camp where they invite in high schoolers to come in, and that is really where the, one of the sources that they have for new talent. Um, but it shows you the, the extent to which many manufacturers have had to become proactive because they are not seeing the, the educational institutions meet those needs. But we are seeing shortages in welders, mechanics, engineers, et cetera, across the board. And if I could just add very uh, quickly a very important point that I think you will take a lot of interest in on, uh, 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 to underscore what Chad just said, the, uh, the manufacturing and business community is very eager to have input into curricula and, and to be involved in solving th this problem. W where the resistance is, is in the education establishment. Um, so I think that is a very, very important point and, and pressure has to be put wh where it appropriately is put in order to get that in increased cooperation between uh, the, uh, the business community, manufacturing, and our education establishments. Being, being from a, a university, could I comment on that as well briefly? W we understand that universities were oftentimes slow to move to respond to the needs of the new economy, but I think that I think some universities are moving, albeit slowly, to, 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 to make sure that our curricula are better suited to the needs. I would point towards internships. Colleges and universities need to do a lot more to promote intern intern internships for our students to ensure that they have at least one internship before they graduate so they have that real world experience in addition to the college classroom and also experiential learning uh, programs. A lot of times we have uh, programs that are moving more towards uh, projects that student students work on that are in conjunction with the local business community. So I would think uh, I, I think businesses, colleges are doing better, but they can do even more to, to promote experiential learning and internships because those are crucial to making sure that the skills that we teach are the right skills. And student loan debt actually is a, is a growing problem in the United States. Do you, how big of a deterrent do you believe that this burden is to entrepreneurship and any other any possible solutions like loan forgiveness programs? Anyone can. We heard about this problem at virtually every roundtable that we conducted, and, and the way that it Im impacts entrepreneurs is that uh, kids who are graduating from school who might be highly inclined to join a startup and are very, very talented and those startups desperately need can't afford to because they are carrying a huge student debt that they have to pay off, and so they go to an established company instead. Um, we offer uh, uh, a couple of ideas for dealing with this, uh, particularly in the context of trying to. Ex um, uh, focus on our increasing need for STEM graduates. And one of the ideas is to think about um, a, a federal tax credit uh, that, that if you are a graduate, uh, uh, you graduated with, with an undergraduate or graduate degree in STEM, that you get a federal tax credit that, that can be applied in increments uh, over the course of five years um, uh, 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 to reducing your taxable income to make it easier to deal with your student debt. Thank you. And I yield back. Mr. Tippin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank the panel for taking the time to be here. Uh, Mr. Derry, I probably could have saved you a lot of money uh, in terms of your research going out. Went out through our district, a lot of rural communities, small businesses that are out there. We heard the exact same stories, uh, you know, during this month of August, frankly, over the last two years as we've traveled through the district. And real frustration uh, from our small business community in terms of opportunities to be able to create jobs and new startups as well, just with the challenges that we face. And um, certainly take no, took no offense, and I don't think anyone here probably did when you were talking about uncertainty coming out of Washington uh, and uh, trying to be able to uh, actually address that over-regulation. Do you have some suggestions 
uh, in terms of we would actually passed a bill with some bipartisan support out of the House of Representatives called the RAINS Act uh, to be able to put Congress back into those regulatory authorities because I am a small businessman. Uh, incredibly frustrating uh, when we have to be able to have the proverbial act of Congress a vote through the House, a vote through the Senate, a presidential signature to be able to rescind something that we never voted on. And uh, we all know we need rules and regulations. Uh, do you have some thoughts on being able to simplify that? Uh, you know, we've had 174,000 new pages added, uh, 4,000 new regs are in the pipeline. Uh, I think Mr. Montre uh, noted we've got over $2 trillion regulatory costs, and that's just the federal end of the world. There are state costs, county costs, city costs uh, that are literally crippling our ability to get this economy moving, considering we've got the lowest labor participation rate in the last 36 years. Uh, it's quite right, and the uh, and the study that uh, Chad's group uh, put out uh, yesterday is only the most recent confirmation uh, that we have a problem. Uh, the government is very, very good um, uh, by its nature at putting out uh, regulations. It is not very good at, uh, on a regular basis, going back, streamlining existing re regulations, getting rid of regulations that no longer are appropriate, et cetera. Um, I, I think, a, uh, in addition to the RAINS Act, I call your attention to um, a piece of legislation that, and, and forgive me, I don't remember all the details, I will get it to you, but I believe it is called uh, the Regulatory Improvement Act. I know that Congressman Mulvaney w was a, a co-sponsor. I can't remember the other uh, co-sponsor, but I will get it to you. Uh, it is based on an idea that came out of, of all places, and I say that with great respect, but it just is not the kind of place you tend to associate with, with an effort uh, uh, to reduce regulation. Uh, the Progressive Policy Institute, and specifically Mike Mandel, an economist there um, who has spent a lot of time thinking about the impact on businesses of just the, the buildup over time of regulation. Even if every single one of the regulations passed was appropriate and needed, the sheer buildup over time, he likens it to pebbles in a stream or barnacles on the bottom of a boat, erodes the productive capacity of the economy. And he suggested a, a um, a, a mechanism based on the BRAC Commission, the base closing and realign, you know, whatever the, the words are, uh, 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 that uh, that model would prove to be very, very effective in terms of eliminating excess capacity in our in, in our military base system. And he applies the same idea, the same principles to a regular uh, uh, a committee, uh, a, a, you know, sort of a blue uh, a blue ribbon panel of experts that would take on a specific aspect of our regulatory code on a regular basis, a scoop of the pebbles, as he calls it, conduct public hearings of stakeholders, et cetera, et cetera, and then make recommendations um, uh, in terms of streamlining, elimination, you know, combining, et cetera, that would be submitted to Congress for an up or down vote. Uh, and uh, he believes that that would be very effective. I think it would be very effective. It is a, it's a wildly intriguing idea. It has been submitted. That bill has been dropped. Um, and uh, as I say, I will get the details to you because I think it, it holds a great potential. Great, and I appreciate that. Uh, you know, small business guy, I had a pretty simple principle that I tried to live by. You know, if it doesn't work, stop doing it. If it is broken, fix it. Uh, if it is in the way, get it out of the way uh, to be able to get the economy moving. Mr. Deskins, uh, you are an economist. And one of the deep concerns that I certainly have in my district is uh, we have some of the lower per capita income, save Aspen and a couple of our resort areas mm -hmm. uh, in my district. Uh, when we are talking about these $2 trillion in regulatory costs, businesses pass those costs on, don't they? Of course. Those costs have to flow through. I mean, businesses don't pay taxes. People pay taxes, as the famous saying goes. So either the consumers are going to pay, the owners are going to pay, or the employees are going to pay fundamentally. Uh, I agree that I agree with what uh, Mr. Deary said a second ago, that regulatory policy is uh, complex. And I would add, you know, my piece of that is tax policy is complex. And I think we would find that, uh, it is, you know, especially given the issue that I discussed with, the, with evasion and avoidance with small businesses when there is a lack of third party reporting, I think that if we could simplify the tax system, if we could uh, just from a very broad perspective simplify the, the, the tax system as well as the regulatory system, if we could just reduce the number of exemptions, deductions, and credits that have crept into the system over the last few decades, I think it would help uh, in terms of compliance burden. It would help in terms of the opportunities for evasion and avoidance. And it would also help in terms of overall efficiency if we could combine a broadening of the tax base with uh, lower rates as well. I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, and if I may, Mr. Chairman, I just, just a little bit of a follow-up to that, because this seems to me to be a double-edged sword. Uh, in your testimony, and I uh, noted your comment that taxes do matter, but we're talking about the tax code. 
uh, when we start talking about $2 trillion in regulatory costs, we are virtually having taxation via regulation. Uh, this is impacting moms and dads that are trying to be able to buy clothes for their kids to be able to go back to school. It is showing up in higher prices uh, in terms of the market, marketplace and stifling innovation. Is that accurate? I mean, I think, I think it is accurate. I think that we have a lot of room for, for improving the overall system. I'm just over time, as, as Mr. Deary said, we are good at adding new regulations to target specific issues that pop up. But it's, you know, after regula regulations accumulate over decades, it is really hard to look back and to streamline the broader system as far as regulatory policy goes or as far as tax policy goes. So um, I'm always advocating for a simpler, uh, more streamlined system that, that has broader bases and lower rates. Thank you. I'm out of time. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, for being here. I, I, I think what we, we've seen here is a, a long statement of something that's very seldom correct, and that is that the commonly accepted wisdom is actually correct here, that uh, regulation, the skills gap, uh, overburden, an accumulated list uh, of, of uh, rules and regulations that actually kills the very thing that it's trying to protect, that in an effort to uh, have some control over every outcome, we actually ruin every outcome at some, in some small way. Uh, I do believe that people should be able to capitalize their education in STEM. I think that's an, we, we, uh, that is, uh, businesses can do that with their biggest capital investment. Why shouldn't individuals? So I, I appreciate that comment, and I, I personally support that. Uh, college debt, it's interesting because uh, if you have uh, $100,000 in debt, uh, it is scary to try to open a business on, on top of that. So we, I think that's worth looking at, and I appreciate everybody's comments uh, today. Um, Boy, I wish we had more time. Uh, we have a, a hearing, uh, or rather a um, closed hearing with all the members of Congress at 11 o'clock. Uh, if there are no um, uh, further comments, uh, I want to thank everybody again. I ask unanimous consent that members have five business days to submit statements and supporting materials uh, without objection, so ordered in. Thank you all again.